Okay, um, welcome if you've uh, just joined the stream. Um, I'm gonna wait a couple of minutes for people to join the stream and get involved and, and make sure everything's uh, working okay. Um, I'll do a sound check in a second once I can at least see myself in the stream and then <laughs> we'll get going. If you've uh, just joined the stream, um, let me know if you can hear me clearly um, in the comments. Drop a comment um, so that I can at least make sure you can hear me. And, I'm, and now I'm live as well. So that'd be great. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Hector. Uh, welcome to the stream. Um, it's good to have you on board. Um, it's going to be a fun stream today. Um, we're going to be covering some of the new features in Tableau Desktop 2020.2. Um, last week, I covered uh, relationships, but uh, when the stream starts, we'll go over the new features. I'll show you how to find out what's new in Tableau 2020.2, and then we'll get stuck in. Uh, the features that we're probably going to cover today are set, um, set controls and uh, set action improvements as well. We're not probably going to cover them. We are going to cover them. So <laughs> I'm sorry for that confusion. But we'll get started in, in a few seconds and we'll get going. I'll just wait for the stream to build up. I'll just say hi to some of the people joining. Hello, Giuseppe uh, from Dublin. Uh, nice to see you on the stream. Uh, Chaitanya, I think I said that all right, that right, okay. Um, you're saying not, you're not able to hear me. Um, I think some other people are. So maybe it's a volume uh, issue on your end. Just have a check and see if that's uh, all working on your end and then we'll get started. Um, no worries, Tim, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> We're just about to get started, so uh, not to worry. Okay, I'll get stuck in. Uh, welcome to this live stream on Tableau 2020.2. Uh, today I'm gonna be taking you through some of the new features um, in 2020.2 desktop. Uh, I won't cover every single one, but I will cover pretty much all of them. There's, there's six key features in the desktop release. Um, but just to give you an overview of how uh, this live stream is going to work, let me just uh, click onto the next slide here. Uh, we're gonna do an overview of what's new in Tableau Desktop. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time highlighting uh, the fact that a lot of the desktop and authoring experience also now exists on the web. So some of the features I cover today are also possible through WebEdit. And I'll just very briefly show people where that is, how to find it and get started. Then we'll dive right into the webinar or live stream. I keep saying it's a webinar, it's actually a live stream. I need to get with the times. But uh, we'll dive into uh, the live stream and talk about set controls and improvements to sets in general. And then lastly, we'll touch on the Esri Web Data Connector, then a small little point at the end about the device designer and the improvements to that. We've basically got some new device sizes um, available. So as always, I'll exit the PowerPoint uh, straight away. And I'll just uh, uh, basically go to uh, the new web page um, for Tableau 2020.2, okay? So I'll just scroll to the top. This page didn't exist last time when I was uh, doing the live stream on relationships, but it's actually a really good place to find out what all the new features are summarized in one place, okay? And uh, at the very bottom, what you can always do is you can always go down uh, to the capabilities and you'll see here that I've already got it pre-filtered by uh, desktop. Um, but actually, if you select all, you get a nice little summary of all the features released in this particular release of Tableau. So this involves Tableau Mobile, Tableau Prep, Tableau Desktop, Tableau Server, Tableau Online, and even some of the APIs that are supported by Tableau to allow you to work with um, the platform in a, in a much easier way. And this dropdown sort of just gives you easy access to that. You also see some of the other categories like the Tableau Catalog and the Data Management Add-on. Uh, these, these two sort of over, overlap because of the way they work, um, but uh, fundamentally these are also sort of um, uh, areas of their product. So they actually span things like Tableau Prep and Tableau Server in terms of that capability. So think of them as um, you know, a category in a supermarket, um, but Tableau is starting to sort of diversify that a little bit more, okay? Today, we're gonna to be looking at desktop. 
And if I just filter down to the six features, um, you'll see this is actually a relatively quiet release for desktop in terms of the number of features. But the absolute big hitter, which we covered last week, was relationships. So I won't be going through relationships today. If you want to catch uh, that live stream, I did that last week, you can actually just head to uh, the YouTube channel, the Information Lab YouTube channel, and it's in there uploaded as its own video. So you can catch the first of the four live streams that I did um, there, and it's uh, very, very easy to um, basically go through the content. Uh, you can even drop a comment here, and I, I do my best to try and reply to the questions. I actually saw this particular question today, so I gave a fairly lengthy response because it was a bit of a late reply. Um, but absolutely get involved uh, and, and get started. The last thing I'm going to call out is our meetup page. This is basically where we host all our events. So if you want to find out what's coming up, what's on tomorrow, what's on next week, this is where to come and find out. If you just go to the events tab and uh, you can see a list of events uh, alongside some of the events I'm going to be running in the future. Next week, we're going to be going into uh, Tableau Server and the new metrics capability. And then you can join us on Thursday. I think Thursday is tomorrow. Is today Wednesday? I think so. Yeah, it is. Um, you can join us tomorrow. Uh, where we have training in the afternoon. So you can come in, get involved, and learn something new uh, in our training sessions. But without further ado, let's, uh, let's dive into the live stream. The first thing I want to highlight is the fact that um, a lot of the capabilities in Tableau Desktop uh, are available through WebEdit. Okay? And it's a little bit of a, an interesting journey about you know, understanding which ones are and which ones aren't. And so I'm going to show you two ways of finding out. The first and most obvious way is just to you know, sign into Tableau Server if you have access to it. If you don't, you could always you know, get a developer account and play around with the betas or get access to the beta itself and um, you know, just experience sort of the interface uh, of Tableau online. You can see here, this is my own um, sort of development instance. And you can just go in here and uh, start to get familiar with how the Tableau online works. But the key thing to bear in mind is that when you're building a new asset in Tableau online, you're essentially building a workbook. And so when you click on the new uh, workbook option, you get this experience, which is entirely focused around the web. And of course, you've got connectors that are web friendly here. So you've got uh, things like uh, the big databases that we used to, Amazon, MySQL, uh, Oracle as well. But then you can also um, you know, upload files uh, directly from your computer or just access data sources that are already published. In this case, I'll just connect to Superstore Sales. And once you connect, you can actually just use uh, pretty much most of the uh, desktop capabilities. So um, when they add things like um, the relationships, that's also available here in WebEdit. You can, you can see that as I, um, uh, as I drag this item here, in fact, I'm doing it from the wrong place. You see you get the dimensions and measures sort of call out there. So all the new features, especially in desktop, tend to be available in WebEdit right from the get-go. The uh, other thing I recommend you do is um, search for this visualization by my colleague, Andrew Pick. I should have really found this before the live stream, um, but I just search those things every time and it comes up the top hit. What I'll do is I'll put a link to this in my uh, um, description below so you can access it and see um, this viz. What this viz does is it highlights the capabilities that are available in Tableau Desktop versus Tableau Web Edit. So Andy's actually updated this with the 20.2 20 .20 version. So you can straight away see what you can and can't do. And there's still a few things you can't do in Web Edit. But in some areas, like creating views and building dashboards, it's almost one to one parity. So I expect this to sort of close uh, the gap as we get further and further into the 2020 releases. And um, I certainly expect by next year, we'll, we'll hopefully start to see the majority of these features being available through the browser. In some cases, even uh, coming to the browser first compared to desktop. Okay, so that's just an important thing to bear in mind. All these features we go through, they are some of them available in WebEdit, and you can start using them. However, I'm not brave enough to try and show you anything in WebEdit. I'm much more comfortable with desktop. I won't try that challenge today. Maybe in the final live stream, I'll do that. Um, but um, let's move over to Tableau Desktop and start covering the first of the new features, which is uh, set controls. Uh, sets generally and also improvements to sets. Let me just switch over to uh, Tableau Desktop. Okay, uh, it would actually help if I had it open. So let me open up. Um, I think I was too efficient with my preparation. Just give me one second while this opens up. You'll see here I have uh, I have a cheeky folder of, of stuff I've already tried and, and practiced. I, I do this with all the beaters. Um, and I highly encourage other people to do that. Um, if you uh, access the link in the description, I actually have all of this available for you to, to access and play with as well. 
And you'll see that I have a starter uh, workbook here. So this is the one I'm going to open in 2020.2. And um, this is what we're going to work with today. I'll just wait for that to open and we'll get going. Uh, hello, Robert. Um, Robert from Amsterdam. It's great to see you on board. Uh, keep, keep the comments coming through. I'm going to make more of an effort today to, to sort of check what's going on. Um, now Tableau's opened up. I'm just going to bring this into uh, view. So finally, we're in uh, Tableau desktop and um, we can, can kind of get going. Let me just get this to full screen so you have a, a nice experience. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Well, this is my workbook called Set Control Starter. What I didn't want to do is spend half an hour building this example, because that I think would have been the most boring live stream in the world. But I will walk you through exactly what's going on. So when I click on a particular outcode, what you'll see is that the chart changes context. Okay, And this is a really powerful feature introduced uh, last year, where essentially you're able to change the context of the question you're asking by adding a value to a set or removing an item from a set, and then doing calculations at the level of that set uh, to compare things. So when I say select E17, two things are happening here. Tableau is getting the average price for properties in E17. This is housing data. It's then going across all the other uh, regions. You can see they're all highlighted in different colors. Um, and then it's comparing the average price of all of those and then doing the calculation broken down by each outcome. So the color tells you how much more expensive or cheaper it is in terms of the average price to live in that area or the properties in that area. So let's say I go to somewhere really expensive here in central London. Most of the chart turns red because in contrast to that location, a lot of the uh, average prices are considerably lower. And you can see I've topped off the scale here at minus 500,000 pounds. And the upper end of the scale is uh, 500,000 pounds. So there are actually places with a higher average price than that particular uh, part of London that I selected. Okay. And so how does this, how does this work? You're probably asking well, what, what crazy voodoo is this? Um, well, this is sets. This is how it works. So let me go into this and let's just dissect this. Then I'll show you the new feature, which is set controls. Okay. We've got uh, a sheet here and notice when I click in the sheet, nothing happens. Okay. So the first thing we have to factor in here is that this uh, action that we're using only applies at the dashboard level. I haven't applied it at the worksheet level. And so I can see that by going back to the dashboard, going to the top here where you can see I've got these options and you'll see here, I've got actions uh, available. I'll just highlight this on the screen. I've got this nice new toy here. So you can see um, more clearly than last time where I thought I was zooming and I wasn't. Um, and when I click on actions, you get this um, interface here where we can see I've got two actions. And this particular second action is the one that's actually applying the set. So it's basically doing a simple thing. When I select an outcode, it's applying that and adding it to the set. Okay, so it's adding the value to the set. Now I'll click OK. The other trick I've got here is that this highlight action is actually highlighting everything, if that makes sense. So I'll show you what happens if I don't have this. Let me just remove this and then click OK. When I select something now, you see it, it, everything fades out. So let's just select that again. Everything fades out. And so I lose the effect of the color. So this is a little trick where you apply uh, an action on itself and it highlights everything, but still highlights the key context of the thing you, you selected. So I'll just undo that by going back. Uh, let's go back again. And then let's uh, try and click on that again. It's probably disappeared. I'm going to have to uh, build it right in front of you. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. And I'll show you how this works. So I select highlight and uh, selected fields. And I've got this calculation, which says all. And it's basically just a text, a text string that says all. And the field is called all. And it's just applying it to itself. That's pretty much it. And um, basically what the effect that, that has is it highlights everything when you select something, not just, uh, not just the thing you selected. And, but you can still see what you've selected in sort of uh, clear detail. The second thing to dissect is the calculations going on here. So I've got uh, two um, sort of critical calculations. They're over here on the bottom left. I'll just sort of zoom in. Yeah. So the first one is uh, selected price. This is basically a calculation that when I select an outcode, it calculates the average price or the total prices in that particular selection. Okay. I can select one, I can select two, I can select multiple ones. The next thing it does is it goes and calculates the average for that selection. So if I just open up this particular calculation, uh, it's opened up in a new window. So let's just bring it in. 
you'll see this is a bit of an involved uh, LOD. Uh, if you're not familiar with LODs, this can sort of seem like an abstruse concept. But what I'm basically doing is I'm telling Tableau to ignore the out codes that I've selected when it calculates the average price for my selection, okay? So I select maybe one or two or three. I tell Tableau to ignore the out codes so that it doesn't try and do the calculation at the level of detail of each out code. It aggregates the average price for those selections, whether it's one, three, or four. And then it captures that average price. And the last thing I can do is then compare that average price against the average price of everything in the visualization. So I've got this little calculation pre-commented here where I basically take the average price. This doesn't need an LOD. This basically just looks across the entire visualization and then computes that against this average price for the selection I've made. And that's why this is, this is called that way, okay? And the set that's sort of driving all of this, if I go to the selected price calculation is this one here, uh, the outcode set. And so you're probably wondering, well, how do I create this? I'll just close this tab. And you can see that I've actually already got this uh, particular set um, here uh, highlighted in blue. But you can just uh, uh, select any field and then go to create and then set. And it basically creates exactly the same thing. So what is a set? A set is basically just another way of defining a group. And in this case, if I edit the set, you'll see that everything is selected. So everything is currently sitting in my set. So what this chart is actually showing is the difference in price compared to the average of everything, if that makes sense. So the average price for everything in this visualization is 723,000 pounds. It's largely driven by some of these more expensive sort of areas of London. And then it's comparing the average price of each individual region against that average price, if that makes sense. It's a bit of a tongue twist of a calculation to explain, um, um, but um, it's pretty much what the calculation is doing. So then now if we go back in here and we start clicking on this, you'll see that the chart changes to reflect that. And that's sort of how the, the, the basic functionality works. It would be criminal to uh, not explain how this works uh, before getting into set controls, which is, which is why I've done it in that order. Now there's one key step in terms of set controls. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this uh, filter option off. You can just see it here. I'm just gonna zoom in on it so you can see it more clearly here. So this filter option here, which basically looks at the set is absolutely fundamental and I'll show you why. Let me remove this set, okay? And nothing will change in the visualization. And in fact, uh, you know, when I click on the visualization, it will still change, okay? But if I go to this drop down, I won't see an option for sets in this uh, menu over here, okay? So this is really key. If you want to be able to use set controls and have a filter-like interface for your set, then you need to have that set in the filter pane. So let's go and see how that's done. Let's drop in and you'll see that I've just got the depth field filter at the moment. And when I drag the outcode set, initially the first thing that happens is sort of um, uh, slightly strange because you, you know, nothing changes. And then if I go and edit the filter, you'll see that everything's selected. Now sets when placed in filters can have two capabilities. Okay, let me just click on this drop down, and you'll see here that this set can do two things. It can either show members in and out of the set, or it can show basically what's in and it's so, so weird. It can either only show members in the set, or it can show whether members are in or out of the set. That's a slightly sort of different um, sort of way of asking the same question, okay? So let's, let's see what happens if I go back to the visualization and I bring in that set action, okay? You can see that now it's, a, it's available there. You can see the set control is now available and I can bring in the outcode set. And let's just bring in the uh, outcode set and you'll see that I get this lovely list, okay? But if I deselect all, just give it a second. It deselects everything. And this, this isn't the behavior I want. I don't wanna just look at one region. I want to look at all regions, okay? So what I need to do is go back and change that filter. Let's just hop back in and change that to show in and out of set, okay? And that will basically um, allow me to do a couple of things. I'm just gonna use the all capability because I don't wanna prescribe what I'm selecting here in the filters plane. And then click okay. Then if I go back, um, now you can see that when I uh, untick this, the map doesn't disappear. I've got nothing selected. So the comparison is comparing against nothing. So it uses this value right in the middle here at zero. But if I select E8, that's now one item in the set and it's now comparing 
against that particular selection. And so this is the powerful feature with set controls. I don't have to interact with the visualization. I can just select multiple values here and my chart dynamically updates to reflect that selection. And because this is a filter, I've got lots of different capabilities. So I can do a single value dropdown to force a user to select just one item. I can go and choose something maybe a bit different in a different part of London to see, uh, let's see what's, what's some of these more expensive areas, uh, W2. Let's go to W2 and see what happens when we select that. So you'll see the colors change completely. And so you can actually see that's working. And you can also um, choose a multi-value dropdown here. So this is probably better in this case because it lets me select um, multiple um, areas. But this is working exactly the same as the set that I've applied myself, which is just letting me do the selection. So that's the first key feature of um, desktop sort of capabilities in 2020.2. Set controls now give filter-like interfaces for sets, um, which before was slightly weird because they were only possible through user interaction. But now they're possible through a filter pane. You can start to differentiate a little bit how the user interaction work and, and make it easier for users to use. So that's the first key feature. The next key feature is the ability to add and remove items from a set directly from a visualization. So you probably wonder, wait, how, how does that work? Okay. So you can see here when I make a selection, I'm just basically uh, uh, selecting items uh, on the visualization. Uh, but if I go back to my actions pane, let's go over here to actions. And you'll see I've only got this one uh, sort of capability here to, 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 to change the items. And if I hit edit, you'll see they've added an area here at the bottom where I can now, instead of just assigning the values to set. I can actually add values to the set and remove values to the set just by interacting with it. So let's say I have a list and I want to dynamically add something to my shopping list. I can just go down the list and click them and it's dynamically adding them to the set. Okay. So let me show you how that works. I'm not going to change what we've done here. I want to leave that as an example. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a new sheet. It's not going to be a pretty sheet. I'm just going to bring the out code to rows. And then I'm going to uh, put the out code on text. What that does is it basically puts the text as a label. And then I'm going to do a cheeky thing and hide the out code. So I've basically got a nice like uh, drop down sort of capability here. Um, the next thing I'll probably do is um, I probably won't do anything actually. I'm, just, I'm going to be super lazy. Sorry. Um, I'm just going to put this in the tooltip and just put average price to give the user a little bit of um, context as they sort of navigate this. And then it's a sort of more interesting list. Okay. I'll maybe uh, center this as well, just to give it a little bit more of a, a stylistic um, sort of style. And uh, I'll maybe spread these out in order to space these out a little bit better. I'm just going to need to bring the header back and just. Um, Increase the amount of space there. Then uh, I'm going to hide the header again. So we have a list, basically, of the different postcodes. The next thing I'm going to do for your benefit is I'm going to add whether or not the item is in the set. So this is just basically uh, a, a dimension that basically shows you whether something is in or out of the set. And at the moment, everything is in the set because uh, the way the selection is working at, at the moment. So let me hide that label. Then let's go back to the dashboard. Let's select one specific item. Uh, this is uh, this is E17. So what should happen here is you'll see that E17 is in the set. Okay, so this is working. The sheet is working exactly as I want it to work. Let's bring this onto the dashboard and uh, just just drop it here below the outcode set filter. Okay, and I need to give this a little bit more space. So let's go ahead and squash my map. So now we have this selection, and just watch what happens. Let's say I select uh, three items. It creates a nice little list that tells me what's is selected. And you can see the highlight action is actually causing a bit of disruption here. So let's uh, go into the actions pane. We're going to fix that, but we're also going to add the new capability, the new improvement to add and, add and remove sets uh, items to a set dynamically. So let's just go edit our highlight action here so it doesn't apply to sheet number two. And click OK. So let's just uh, see that works great. OK. Dashboard actions. Let's just go back in. And um, the other thing that's happened here is that this particular sheet um, is applying itself over to the other one as well. So let's just make sure these are these aren't sort of causing havoc. Good. Okay. Cool. And now let's just um, just test this. Make sure it's still working. Okay. Great. So let's add this new action from sheet number two. Let's just add this as a new action. And I'm going to probably set this up um, as um, 
a selection item just on sheet two. So I'll deselect sheet controls, set controls, and I'm going to add this item here to add values to the set. Okay, so add value to set. And I could even maybe add the outcode itself to the list. And then the set I want to if, uh, affect is this outcode set. Okay. And I don't want anything to happen if you know I clear the selection. I probably want to build another action that removes things from a set, if that makes sense. Let's just hit OK. And I want this on a selection. So at the moment, if I just select these three items, you'll see here that uh, it's got E4, E10, 11, E17 to the set. But watch what happens now when I click E6. It also joins the set, okay? So I've got this really cool way of basically making a list that is dynamically adding to the set, okay? And then obviously, um, let's say I was making a team selector. What you'd really want is a view that shows you who's in your team and who's out of your team. And as you make a selection, uh, they disappear from the list. And so what you'd, what you'd ideally have is like a, a list on the left-hand side and a selection on the right-hand side. And as you make selections, your team is being populated and the total value is being aggregated and you can sort of see the network. So this is going to be great for fantasy football players out there. Uh, I, I highly expect this to be a big feature on Tableau Public as well. But that's pretty much it. If I make a manual selection, you know, it still observes that, that control. Um, I need to sort of figure out that little bit of um, sort of that little tip about self-selection. I think what I'd probably do here, it sounds a little, a little bit messy, is actually add the all uh, item here into rows to make sure that's available to the, to the sheet, hide it, then go back into the dashboard, then go back into the actions. It's a little bit of a journey with Tableau sometimes, isn't it? And um, let's hit highlight. Then this is just on sheet two, not on the other sheet. And on selection, and selected fields on all, click OK, click OK. And now when I make a selection, um, OK, it highlights itself in a slightly different way. It's a little bit frustrating, but it doesn't get list of the, again, it doesn't get rid of the list as it were, and this sort of functionality still works. So maybe someone uh, can suggest another way of, of, of solving that problem. That my OCD is not letting me live with that yellow. Um, but that, that's pretty much uh, the capability. You can obviously add the same capability to remove something from the set as well. So that's something just to be aware of. Okay. So that's pretty much uh, it for sets and set controls. Um, I highly encourage you actually to uh, go on go on Twitter and see lots of different um, sort of uh, takes of this. I must be honest, I really struggle to understand fully how sets work. And so I'm always amazed when I see new use cases for sets and then I sort of take them apart and understand them. Then I understand that particular use case. So. Um, it's a really sort of dynamic way of working with Tableau and adding some really cool interactivity um, to, to your dashboards. The next uh, feature I'm gonna talk about is Esri, which is a mapping capability. It's slightly different from the usual uh, thing we'd, we'd, we'd cover in a webinar. So um, to do this, I'm actually gonna just close this workbook. Um, uh, do I wanna save this? Yes, let's save this. Um, and then uh, let's just open Tableau 2020.2 again. I reliably did this a little bit earlier on. So here we are. Okay. And so the next feature we've got in, in the release, let me just go back to the browser, wherever that is. Just give me one second to get Windows up. The next feature is this uh, capability to connect to Esri using a web data connector. So the web data connector is essentially a new type of connector that was, that was introduced, I'm not sure last year, but the year before that, where um, basically you could use the connector to build your own connections to APIs. Okay? And APIs are just um, interfaces for connecting to data on the web. And so let's say you need a, a very bespoke connector to something and it's an API, you could build your own. But what Tableau have done is they've basically used that capability to build a new connector for Esri um, data sources that are hosted uh, on the web. And so all you need is your Arc uh, GIS server URL and your GeoService API URL. Now, I'll be completely frank with you. I have no idea what those are, apart from the fact that I found an example. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you how to connect to that in, in Tableau itself, okay? So for those in the spatial world, you'll absolutely know exactly what those things are and what they mean. Uh, but in this case, I'm using an example given to me um, by the beta process. So I've basically found that um, 
I don't know, King County. I think this is a Canadian uh, district or either an American or Canadian district. Uh, I really apologize if anyone from Canada or the US is here and uh, is appalled by the fact that I don't know that. But what they do is they provide this uh, RESTful API um, for their mapping server. And so you can literally see a directory of what's available um, to you to map. And it's a really, really cool set, uh, set, set of data. What I've done in advance is I've, I've grabbed a couple of the data sets. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, copy uh, one, one link. And then I'm going to show you how to connect to it in advance. And then the next example I'll do is using this particular one, which is uh, Trails. Okay, So we'll connect to it once. Uh, and then we'll um, connect to it again in Tableau. And I'll highlight something to do with relationships and the data model um, whilst mapping, which is really cool sort of um, integration. So you'll see here that I get the option to connect to a server. In my particular case, uh, the option is actually already here. You can see that Esri Arc GIS server is actually um, already there because I've been connecting to it in, while practicing for this uh, live stream. Uh, but if you don't see that, you could just you know access this list of more uh, data connections. This is typically a longer list on Windows machines. It's probably three columns now on Windows machines. And it's a slowly growing list on Mac because not all um, uh, drivers are, are, are available for Mac uh, computers. But you can see here Arc uh, GIS. And this behaves very much like other web data connectors where it asks you for a URL. And so let's uh, paste that in here and just let's connect. And it's pretty much it. Uh, typically, when these uh, services are available, they're normally either public or they work within a VPN. So if your organization has one, you'll probably need to be uh, in the VPN or in the firewall region uh, for this uh, URL to work, okay? Now that I've connected, you'll see that I get specific tables that are available in my data set. And if I actually just uh, go back to the browser and I just paste the link that I've just used, let's just put this in a new tab, you'll see this is the uh, link I've just used and uh, when I paste that, you'll see that it actually gives me the same information here, but in a web format. So you can sort of access this information in two ways to know what you're getting in advance. Okay, let's go back to Tableau. And the key thing here is when I obviously drag uh, any particular item, let's just drag a drainage complaint in, you'll see that I get this preview of a table. And like all APIs, you don't always see an automatic preview of your data set. Okay, if I hit update now, what it does is it does like a quick API call to the data set. It brings some data and then it shows that uh, here. So this can take a while if it's a web data source because you essentially don't know how much data you're querying. I, I don't have any context about this data. And so sometimes it can take a little while. The other thing to bear in mind is that the uh, connection is always an extract. You can never connect to web data sources live. And um, it's just the way the connection works and the way that Tableau that needs to make some sort of a database or model of that data to work uh, inside of Tableau. It's, um, it's bugging out a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna hope, hope and pray that when I go to the next sheet, it just starts trying to create an extract. I might've asked too much of it um, in this. So let's just, um, let's just give it a second. There we go. Um, I trusted and it worked. It's creating an extract. Um, let's just wait for this um, to finish. When I tried this, it was not this slow. So I can only assume something was going on. Um, either with the server or with my laptop. So let's just wait and see uh, what happens here. It's retrie retrieved 12,000 rows. Uh, 12,000 drainage complaints. Wow, that's a lot of complaints. I guess I don't know how big um, King County <laughs> is, so I have no clue whether that's small or a lot, but to me that sounds like a lot. In fact, it's, it's a growing number of complaints. Um, hopefully not a real-time growing number of complaints. <laughs> that would be awful. Um, all right, so this is actually taking a little bit of time. Um, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cancel this because I have no idea how long this is gonna take. It took a lot less time last time. So extraction was canceled, click continue. And we're just gonna reset this and we're gonna start again. And I'm gonna do a different data set that I know is tiny uh, for the benefit of this demo. If you ever want to watch someone solve a problem in real time, uh, this, this, this is what it's like. It's a very uh, quiet affair. Um, oh, wow, OK. Decided to connect. That's fine. Just skip right through.
All right, if we go back and edit the data source. Apologies for this little hiccup. Whatever I asked it to do, it really didn't like it. Um, it's not my computer being unresponsive, it's uh, just Tableau being unresponsive. I might, I might need this and just uh, bring up the activity monitor and just kill Tableau and then start again. Uh, that will probably be much faster than waiting for it to do something anytime during the stream. So let's, let's find a Tableau here. If you ever wondered what a Mac troubleshooting session is like, here we are. Oh no, it's decided to play ball over there. That's fine, it's doing a kill it anyway. Let's quit Tableau, force quit. There we go, Tableau's been killed. Let's open it again, Tableau 2020.2. Close this. And uh, I'm gonna use the other one I had as a backup, which is about trails, because I know this is a much smaller data set, has uh, several trails in the, in the, in the region, and we, we can actually find out where King County is as well. I'm not, get, not interested in opening the old workbook that broke. So we're gonna start this again, Esri ArcGIS server, uh, click connect, must have been something wrong with the connection or the way that I maybe tried to do a live preview, then take an extract sort of too close together. It's probably my own fault. Um, and then let's just take regional trails. And then we're going to hop straight into sheet one. And what it will do is it will take an extract of that data set. So you can just see it's loading the data. Just give it a few seconds. It's retrieved quite a few regional trials. So we'll just wait for that to finish. There you go, and it's pretty much created the extract. So what we've just done there is we've connected to Esri, uh, a web server. We've uh, pulled in a particular table, which is all the trails. And uh, because this is a, a file, a, a data set with spatial information, I can actually just double click shape and it automatically draws the information. So uh, let's, let's make this map a little bit more interesting and uh, change the layers to some of the nice new uh, sort of interesting map styles. And I'm really keen to zoom out and figure out where exactly King County is. So Seattle, oh wow, this is like Tableau's own uh, playground as it were. I should have really known that off the top of my head, um, but I would have just thought this would be called Seattle, not King County, or whatever that is. But um, here we are, we've got the map. And what I can do is I can, I'm gonna wash it out a little bit so we don't lose the trails uh, in context of sort of the cities around them. And then what we can do is just bring in the uh, trail types onto color. And so you can see the different um, different types of trails, or we can even see the different types of turf. I think uh, surf type. So I think surf here is like the type of um, yeah the type of path, whether it's a paved, soft, or um, unknown surface. So you can see that sort of nicely visualized here, and that's that's now sort of uh, available here, and it's very easy to sort of map and, and work with. The other thing you can do if we go back into this uh, connection is. Just because you've connected to this as a, as, a, as a one connection doesn't mean you can't do things like cross data source joints. So you can still add another data set, whether it's Excel or another Esri data source um, to this. And as well as uh, sort of having this regional trails, uh, I'm just gonna throw this in and just see what happens. You'll see that the data modeling capabilities are also still available. So th I think this is really cool because this is an API I'm working with. And not only that, um, all the capabilities of working with databases are sort of still available to me to use here, which I think is a really, really powerful sort of capability. This relationship makes no sense. Um, it's looking at two spatial files. Um, but what I might do, what I might decide to do is to see if any of the trails intersect. So let's uh, remove this. This is a really speculative, speculative question. So let's just hop in, click open. And we've got the regional trails. Let's just uh, drop in uh, other trails. And then uh, in this uh, equal sign here, let me just zoom in here so you can see what's going on. Uh, you'll see that I get this option. When I'm doing joins with spatial data sets, it can obviously look at the, um, the columns and, and sort of try and see if there's any fields match. But the actual thing I wanna do here is to see if there's an intersect. And I think what I have to do is I also have to make sure I select the, um, the shape, okay, uh, for the spatial, item to actually trigger. And then you see you get intersect. So you can see here, now that I've selected two spatial objects, I then get the ability to do a spatial join using the intersections 
um, of how that works. So this works exactly as you'd expect. Uh, if I choose an inner join, it's only going to bring back trails which overlap, which I think makes sense. Uh, if I do a left join, it's only going to bring trails uh, from other trails that match my regional trails or overlap with my regional trails uh, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to try and make this an interesting chart. So let's just do a left join. Uh, we can close this now. This is our physical layer, if you recall last week. I'll, help, I'll hit close. You'll see that we've got this new join icon as part of the data model. And then if we go to sheet one, fingers crossed, this actually makes sense. And also that it doesn't break. So let's, let's just see what happens here. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I think that's kind of worked. Um, it hasn't broken my existing chart, which is a good start. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll just clear this chart and just see if I can bring a shape for my other trails to see what's going on in there. And um, yeah, nothing nothing overlaps. It has technically done the intersection, but these two data sets don't have something um, that overlap. And so this one null option is probably just. Um, you know, information that's empty in that particular data set because I did a left join, so it's brought the columns through anyway, but there is nothing matching in that column. So, um, but that's something you can try. Let's say you have complaints and then you have, uh, you know, geospatial regions, you could map the complaints to regions. That was what I was hoping to do in, in the demo earlier on with the other data set that, 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 that kind of failed because it had two um, sets of data that we were going to dive into. But that's pretty much it. That's the new connector here um, for Esri. Uh, it makes it much easier to work with web data sources and, uh, and Esri in a workbook, and you still get the same capabilities as you'd expect, especially with the data model in 2020.2 and all the old great stuff like cross database joins um, as well. I'm going to close this workbook. Uh, I'm not going to save this because that, that demo didn't quite work how I planned. So I'll create another one and I'll put that in the Dropbox folder. The last feature to cover is going to be, uh, let me just open Tableau again. It's going to be a small, small uh, update to device designer. Okay, so if you've uh, edited or built a mobile dashboard, uh, a couple of things have happened over the last few years. Actually, what they've done is they've slowly enhanced the features um, for mobile device design, and uh, to the point now where if you're not careful, there's actually a default mobile design in pretty much all dashboards. So about three versions ago, they flipped the switch so that Tableau automatically creates a mobile version of every single dashboard. Okay, and uh, if I go to the phone option here, you'll see that it's already got one that was pre-built. And if you go to dashboard, you can see here that I get this option for automatically creating uh, uh, layouts. Okay, and if I untick that, that phone layout won't be created for me, if that makes sense. So this is something to always check because some people might, you know, go to your server on their mobile device and find something that you didn't build but has been automatically generated that isn't ideal. So just make sure you check that option. The minor update here is if I uh, just go to device preview, uh, they've basically added the, um, the most recent iPhones and, and devices to this list. Okay, So you, they, you now have sort of um, better sort of screen real estate to represent the mobile phones we have today. And they also have this context here for Tableau mobile app. That's actually been there for quite some time. That basically adds the little um, sort of space at the top of the phone and the bottom of the phone for the interface. And you can see how much space it takes up um, in this case. Maybe you're embedding this in your own mobile app. That's why you'd have this option off. Um, and, and that's essentially just how it works. And that's pretty much it. There's not much here. I have to say, this isn't a radical feature because you could always define your own uh, sort of size here anyway. Custom still exists. Um, so you could have always sort of changed your orientation of the device and set it up manually. But the cool thing here is that the preset is basically already available. So um, the screen size is nice. And there's a few optimizations if you select that as well. So it will do a few things when it renders the viz just to make sure it looks just right for that phone and, and device. Okay. So if we head back to our new features, uh, we covered relationships last week. Um, today I've shown you uh, set control and set action improvements. We covered Esri and uh, the last one is explain data. Okay. Now explain data is a really sort of cool feature because what it, what it tries to do is it tries to make, um, I'm going to say data science, that's probably not the right word. It tries to sort of nudge the user in the right direction of where their analysis should go next. Okay. So let's uh, look, connect to sample superstore here. 
and uh, let's just very quickly build something. The, the chart I always use is to look at a, um, a product level and then uh, actually, no, actually at a customer level. So let's just search this customer, customer name. Let's look at the customer level of detail. Then look at profit on, on rows and then look at sales. And you get this sort of scatter plot and showing you what's going on. I'll, um, I'll leave it as is. I think the orientation is fine and we can even add a little bit of flair to it and put category and color so we can see what's going on. And explain data is this really cool capability where when I sort of select an item, you get this little light bulb icon. I'll just uh, enlarge this here so you can see it. You can just see it's here. Uh, this light bulb icon uh, essentially fires up a few sort of cool functionalities in Tableau. So let's just see what that does. Let's say I want to see what's sitting behind this outlier. I hit explain data and it fires up this new tab, which basically uh, does some analysis on that particular field. And depending on your data set and where it, where it sits, it's basically trying to understand if there's any sort of statistical basis or understanding that it can derive from that single data point. And so you can see here, this is the analysis for office supplies for Patrick Jones. Uh, and it's analyzed both measures, so profit and sales. And um, you can see that's what I've got in columns and rows. And it's basically come to two conclusions, okay? The first thing is that the selected mark uh, office supplies Patrick Jones has an average profit of 2,664. That's higher than an expected average, okay? And then it shows you what happens if you exclude that item from your, um, your analysis. So if I just hit on this little chart, it actually builds a chart which excludes that item. So you can see that this now excludes, um, uh, I think this is actually Patrick Jones's own version. Yeah. So this is showing you Patrick Jones's own activity, sorry, rather than uh, excluding um, uh, that capability. Okay. But it doesn't delete sort of my previous analysis. I can still sort of go back to where I created this from and uh, access the next thing. If I select extreme values, it shows you a little bit more information that there's one or two sort of exceptions here because there's quite a few large purchases that are skewing the average here as well. Okay. So it's noticed two particular things. And the way it does that is it analyzes all the fields. And you can kind of get a sense of that by looking at this tab here at the bottom. These are the new sort of capabilities over the last couple of versions. And um, in 2020.1, they added this ability to understand uh, what fields were considered and what Tableau did, okay? But the really cool thing with 2020.2 is you can actually choose what fields it analyzes. So let's say you don't agree with the way it analyzed everything. You could just come in here and deselect uh, specific, particular, specific things that you don't want it to look at. You don't, want it, you don't want it to even waste time looking at. Click OK. And it will go away, reanalyze the data. And it comes back and it arrives at the same conclusion. Okay. Now, the thing is, it will always need to be able to analyze what's in the view. Okay. So if I go here to uh, customer name, you see, I've unticked that. So in this particular case, it's not analyzing sort of the measure that sits behind that. And that's, you can see some of these are sort of grayed out because I, um, I think that's partly because they're not see, significant in the analysis that Tableau is doing, but it's also got sort of a different split between uh, measures and dimensions. So it's got a really sort of clear segregation of what it can't and can't do. And so this is, this is quite cool because it, you can now sort of focus how Tableau does this and how it uses this capability. And then secondly, you can sort of play around with this to see if there's any sort of any anything that changes when you exclude something from an analysis. Let's say um, a particular region is skewing something. You can sort of remove the regions and see if Tableau arrives at a different analysis if it just doesn't look at regions um, as part of its context. So I think that's a pretty uh, cool capability. Uh, you'll see that it's going to analyze the data again. Um, and that's pretty much explained data. It's also available through web edit. And so you can get this uh, capability through the web. And uh, my personal sort of you know, plus here is I like the way that it creates charts um, for you. So if you're just curious why an outlier exists, you can just go ahead, it creates a chart, click on that, and it creates a brand new chart appropriately labeled with really cool context already created um, uh, to show what's going on. And some of these can then go on to become really, really interesting stories elsewhere. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to now sort of focus attention on the questions. Um, if I just go back to where I was before. Um, so the last question I had from was, uh, 
Robert. Um, hi, Natalia from Kiev. We've got a really international crowd today. This is awesome. Uh, it's really great to, to, to have people joining in uh, either on their lunch times. It's not lunchtime anyway, unless you're in the, the States. Um, if you're in Europe, then your afternoons. If you're in the States, then round about lunch, round about morning, depending on uh, when you're joining. Um, Andre loves his knee features. Uh, hi, Andre. Nice to see you there. Uh, Keenan from Indonesia. Hello, Keenan. Uh, great to see you there. Um, and uh, Sumit. Uh, Sumit, I uh, don't know where you're from, but hello. Hello back. Um, that's pretty much it um, for this live stream. Uh, I'm going to stay online a little bit more. If you've got any questions, drop them in the comments and get, get stuck in and, and find out a little bit more. Uh, whilst you're thinking about questions or not sending questions in, uh, whichever one you choose, um, I'll just go back and highlight uh, sort of the next live stream next week where we're going to be showing you how to use metrics. Metrics are a super, super cool feature. In fact, I'll give you a little sneak peek into them. Uh, you see here, these, these two charts are metrics and they're basically created from Tableau um, visualizations. And they do really, really cool things um, on mobile devices and they can become alerts as well. And um, so you, you can find out you know, when a metric goes over a certain point, but also you can see uh, sort of comparative information. And I think they actually work better on mobile devices. So next week and during the live stream, I'll hook up my iPad and I'll show you um, how, how that all works. And then we'll go over some of the new features in server as well. There's lots of sort of really cool small features as well that um, would be worth highlighting. Um, but um, yeah, it seems like there's no more, no more questions. Um, I'll hang around a little bit more um, in case there's any, any, any other questions from anywhere else. Um, I'd be really keen to know from the audience, um, what one feature would you, uh, would you like to see um, in the next version of Tableau? Let's assume that you control the developer team. What one feature, one feature, only one, would you like to see um, in Tableau? Okay. I'll give you a little bit of time to, uh, to think of the questions, unless no one's watching, in which case we won't get anything. This is also quite possible. I, I don't believe the, the counter that YouTube is showing me right now. <laughs> You're welcome, Tim. Uh, no worries. Um, thank you for, for thank you for joining in again. I noticed you were you were online last week. Um, we chatted on Twitter afterwards. So look forward to your feedback on today's session um, later on on Twitter. So thank you, thank you for joining again. Let's see if any other questions come in. I've also got to appreciate there's a bit of a lag. So um, it takes about a minute for what I say to actually end up on, on YouTube. Okay. I think we can safely say that uh, there are no more questions then. Um, I say that and then probably a stream of questions will come in. But if there's any questions, what I'll do is I'll answer them in the description uh, below the video. Oh, Joel's just come in just in time. Um, add more keyboard shortcuts, faster development and design of dashboards. I have to say design is probably a weak point of, um, of Tableau. Uh, and I know a lot of people might sort of argue that it, it, you know design is great. You've got all this modern flat design as well. Um, uh, you know, on Tableau Public. But the real truth is it's just not a design tool. So um, I'm really, I'd really love that capability to be enhanced. So we're not using sets to do interfaces or we're not using parameters to do, you know, really simple things. Um, we, we used to have to use sheets to make buttons and that was recently solved. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that being sort of directly addressed. Um, Tableau Prep Builder. Um, yes, we're going to cover Tableau Prep Builder, not next week, but the week after that. So uh, tune in then, and I'll be going through some of the capabilities there. Um, Tim says better layout control, like PowerPoint. I, I actually have to say PowerPoint does have sort of better uh, layout control because it gives you smart guides. It lets you sort of put things side by side, and it's got a sort of contextual awareness when you try and scale things. I, I hate to say that. Um, but yeah, it, it is it is sort of true that PowerPoint's layout capabilities is slightly better. Um, endless hierarchy of, con uh, of, of containers, oh boy. Um, I have to say, Tim, 
I have no reason why you'd have you'd need endless hierarchy. Uh, you should only have one or two layers. Maybe maybe we need a live stream on that. Then I can show you some some awesome tricks with with layout containers. Um, Paul, thank you very much. Um, great to see you on the stream. Uh, glad you enjoyed it. John, thank you as well. Uh, more charts out of the box. Joel, um, this is a great point. Tableau don't often add chart types, and when they do, um, I think it's normally uh, normally sort of you know people almost breathe a sigh of relief because they no longer have to do weird calculations to get them to work. Um, Amia Jamil, uh, can relationships feature be replacement of LAD? Um, I don't think many of the features Tableau introduce are ever a replacement of something. They're typically always enhancements. So there are still instances where you need to use an LAD. In my set actions demo today, relationships would have not solved that problem because what I was doing with an LOD is excluding a piece of information from the context of my calculation. So that's a perfect example where you still need a level of detail calculation. Where an, LOD, where an LOD won't be needed is in instances where you've used the relationship um, and instead of getting um, a join that creates an explosion of data, you'll basically then just um, be able to uh, let Tableau query dynamically between the two data sets and figure out the right level of detail for you and then correctly aggregate everything. So that use case won't need LODs as much, but I still think LODs are useful. Uh, same with blending. Um, blending will still be useful in some cases. Um, and so that's why it will exist, okay? Um, okay, so Tim's uh, highlighted his more detail. Tableau builds the hierarchy by itself. You can't drag and drop um, with, with, within the hierarchy. This is true. This is true. This is very true. I'm going to concede the point right there. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> but what I will say, Tim, is uh, I think great things are coming to, to dashboardings. It's one of those things where has actually had a consistent improvement of features over the last two years, and then suddenly it stopped. And typically when that happens, um, as someone who just keeps his ear on the ground with, with, with the product, that typically means something else is going on that's, that's maybe going to you know, bring about big change. So let's wait and see what happens. Um, OK, everyone. Uh, it's pretty much the end of the stream. Uh, thank you very much for uh, watching the stream. I, I love the patience you guys have, and I love the interactivity that we have on the stream. Uh, join me next week when I uh, go through some of the capabilities on Tableau Server, and we look at metrics in particular, which I think are a really cool addition. I've got it on my screen right now. Um, and yeah, if you've got any questions, drop them in the comments. Uh, you can find a link to all the content I've used today, uh, my Dropbox links, basically, in the description. And yes, share the stream, share this live stream with other people. And I hope you've enjoyed the day. Thank you very much.